everyone. Thank you all for being here. And many thanks to Michael Horn for being with us to talk about current issues in K through 12 education and his new book from Reopen to Reinvent, Recreating School for Every Child. Michael is the co-founder and a distinguished fellow at the Clayton Christensen Institute for Disruptive Innovation, a nonprofit think tank and an adjunct lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He co-hosts the top education podcast, Future You and Class Disrupted. He is a regular contributor to Forbes.com and writes the Substack newsletter, The Future of Education. Michael also serves as an executive director of Education Next, and his work has been featured in outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, Harvard Business Review, and NBC. And I can highly recommend his Substack and his podcast, Class Disrupted, so I suggest you all, when we finish, subscribe to it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Thank you for being with us, Michael. Oh, no, totally my pleasure. And I'm just delighted to be with you all. Um, at Barbara's suggestion, what I thought I would do is I'll talk for 25, 30 minutes or so. I prepared some slides uh, around the book uh, from Reopen to Reinvent. But then what I'm really excited about, frankly, is like what's on your minds and how I can be helpful in questions that you all have, whether it's about the book or you know current events or or anything else on your mind around education and innovation. So uh, we'll 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 dive in from there. I'll share my screen, uh, but then I'll stop sharing uh, after I'm done with the presentation, so that uh, we can actually have a dialogue where we can all see each other. Uh, if that works for folks, feel free to just pop ideas in the chat. I'll keep an eye on it as well uh, as I'm presenting, uh, and then we can go over some of those things as well uh, toward the end. So, uh, and I also want to say, by the way, up front, you should see my screen share now. Uh, I want to say up front, thank you all for being flexible and letting me reschedule. Uh, getting COVID a couple weeks ago was not fun, uh, but I, I'm, I'm on the mend, and, and so I just appreciate it. Uh, so where I want to start is, obviously, when COVID hit uh, in, in March of 2020, the threat was extremely clear. Uh, but you also ha heard a lot of dialogue around, gee, this is an opportunity. And a lot of educators said, we're not going to go back to normal. Like we see the flaws with the system. And uh, and you had a lot of this dialogue, right, going back and forth. And I think the threat, again, extremely clear. And it caused all of these, you know, this devastation and this loss and this move to remote learning and this severance of ties with students in many cases uh, caused us to be very cognizant uh, of, of a lot of, frankly, the buzzwords that educators had long used and known about all of a sudden became popular lexicon for better or worse uh, by parents and the general public, um, which was so interesting. And we had all these words around hybrid learning and asynchronous versus synchronous and Zoom school and Google Classroom and all the stuff that we thought a lot about beforehand, but parents and edu and parents in the general public, shall we say, uh, thought about a good deal less. And what was interesting is in the educators that I talked to, this annoyed them, right? Because like we were talking about the stuff rather than like the real things we wanted to achieve uh, for our learners and for our students. And the thing that a lot of educators told me was that the thing that they hated the most was this phrase, I just want to get back to normal, right? I just want to get back to normal. And you heard it from parents all the time. And the educators that I talked to were saying like, no, we want to do more, right? Like we don't want to go back to normal because normal wasn't working. Obviously this remote school isn't ideal either, but we can do so much more. And what's interesting is when you frame it this way around the learning loss and so forth, the threat again is extremely clear to educators and schools and students and, and public education. And what's interesting about, as I dug into this question of not just reopening, but reinventing, what I learned is actually framing all this stuff as a threat is extremely healthy in like a, in an interesting way. Um, and, and that's because it motivates resources to respond to that threat. And so I think the fact that we have framed it in such menacing terms around learning loss, and obviously most recently the NAEP scores and, 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 and those sorts of things, actually serves a very useful function in terms of galvanizing resources. And you saw that in the federal government's response with billions of unprecedented dollars, right, to, to school districts and states 
to recover uh, from all these things. But what the research also shows is that when you leave it in this threat framing, something called threat rigidity occurs. And threat rigidity is in essence where the organization takes these resources, but then implements them in a very top-down command and control, doubling down on, the, on sort of what we've always done, response. And the, the imagery is, you know, that tiger there or any cat, when they see a threat, it gets their attention. You have my attention. I want to, you know, pay attention to the threat, but the hairs on their back stand up. They arch their back and they sort of go into this paralysis and they only know one way to respond. And, and, and organizations of all stripes do that when confronted with this threat. And it's because we, you know, organizations essentially have these organizational models with value propositions, resources in the form of teachers and school buildings and curriculum, ways of working together to solve problems and, and teach, and then the dollars we need to bring in to deliver on this. And essentially, when ideas that are threats are, are framed in our existing model, this organizational model is really good taking uh, these new ideas or these ideas of what we need to do and twisting and turning them to match the needs of the organization rather than perhaps the new solutions uh, or, or innovations that, that our families and students need. This isn't just schools, to be frank. Like a lot of this research was done around newspapers and they just came in this with very command control, top down double down on your processes, double down on the way you've always done things uh, when they saw online uh, news sites start to pop up. Uh, but what was interesting is that even amidst all this threat and all this challenge, it actually has created, I would argue, some interesting spaces for innovation. And my late mentor, Clay Christensen, used to always love to say that questions create spaces in the brain for solutions to fall into. So even as parents and the general public and so forth have become so consumed with the threat and the learning loss and all the language, right? And all the fights that are going on in school districts and school board meetings and so forth. In the back of their head, there, there are these questions about why does school work this way? Does it have to work this way? Are there other opportunities to do school differently? And my sense is that that creates room for a lot of the things, frankly, that educators have wanted to shift the conversation to around how do we personalize learning, create active learning experiences, mastery-based or competency-based learning, focusing on habits of success, developing really strong relationships, making sure that kids from a mental, social, emotional well-being standpoint are okay, all of those sorts of things. It's created room and opportunity for and the key to realizing this and, and, and really chasing after these opportunities and making it the move from threat to opportunity is first reframing it, frankly, as an opportunity, reframing it as, gee, what could we do if we started from scratch? And then rather than trying to innovate in the existing model, the big idea is to shift and create autonomous areas where educators can come together and create new learning models that get the freedom to rethink all of those resources and ways we've done things and financial formulas and so forth to do something very different. Now, obviously, from a district perspective, that could be a whole brand new school, but it also, frankly, could be a school within a school or a micro school or a, a classroom or a grade band or a subject area where we get the freedom to rethink what schooling looks like. And the big idea is that we, we basically follow this dual transformation process where, look, let's be realistic. The majority of us are in what, what I would call zone A over there. We're focusing on the existing school operation. We are just trying to reopen, trying to do the best we can in the existing model. Uh, and frankly, all the food fights and so forth are occurring over there. But can leadership basically create these zones where educators have freedom and flexibility to recreate school for, for just subsets of students that want to opt in, subsets of families 
that are excited about this, not forcing anyone into these new models, but just these transformation beads where you can create these new models and do schooling very, very differently. And, and the job of leadership, frankly, in that world is just to protect these islands <laughs> from the general uh, conversation. And the really big important idea is that these educators that get to create these tomorrow uh, visions of what school could be, they should not be doing the traditional work. Like their full-time job is innovating and designing and creating these new models. Uh, because the reality is like splitting your time between the old way and the new way is really, really challenging for anyone uh, because the urgent and the necessary of like today <laughs> is always going to get in the way of those things I wanted to do or those things that I was excited about doing and so forth. And so that freedom and flexibility is incredibly important. Now, uh, from my perspective, if we create those autonomous areas, those separate areas for educators, they can first and foremost ask the question, like, what's the purpose of schooling, right? Like, what do we want to actually achieve for our learners? Why are they here? And what do we hope they go out and contribute to society as they leave? Um, in the book, I, I give a six-part uh, definition of like my answer to that question. Um, but my sense is each community will have its own specific twist and turn on this. I start very high level, you know, around maximizing individual potential, helping people discover purpose, build passions and lead choice filled lives. I, my, my read of the literature is we aren't naturally passionate about any one thing. We build passions as we get to work on things as individuals and we make those choices. Uh, participate civically in a vibrant democracy, I think is incredibly important. Contribute meaningfully to work in the economy uh, and the world more generally. And, and then this last one, understand that people can see things differently and that those differences merit respect. And that's actually a very healthy part uh, of, of a society. You know, look, that's my answer. But I think the really important thing is for educators to come up with their answer in conversation with their communities that they're going to serve. And then uh, to do that, you start to think about what's the portrait of the graduate? What are all the competencies and things that we want those individuals to master across a range of domains to create these whole human beings? And so content knowledge is incredibly important still, but so too are cognitive skills within those domains of knowledge, problem solving, communication, uh, collaboration, all those sorts of things. Habits of success. A lot of people talk about that as, Social emotional learning or character skills or non-cog skills or you know, life success skills, like everyone has their own phrase for it. I prefer habits of success just because it frankly takes us out of the political fights that occur around some of these terms. Um, but also there's a very clear set of 16 that I list in the book around developing agency and executive function skills and metacognition and things like that. That when you talk to parents, they tend to not push back against any of those things. So like, yeah, of course I want my kid <laughs> to be able to, you know, exercise agency in the world. Of course I want them to have executive function skills. Of course I want them to have growth mindset and things of that nature. And then this last piece here, the real world experiences and social capital, connecting it to the outside world, making the learning relevant, uh, you know, embedding it in projects and so forth and things of that nature to really make the learning meaningful. And so students understand why they're going to go chase these opportunities. And, and then the last piece is like, I think schools need to very seriously think about the health and wellness and social and emotional well-being of their students, uh, because without that foundation, it's awfully hard for kids to do all these other uh, things and learn. So that's the perspective from the educators, I guess I'd say, as you think about reinvention. But then we get to think about it from the perspective of students, like what do they want? Because we can design the best experience of what they need, but if it's not helping them accomplish their goals, it's not going to go anywhere. And so the next perspective on this is really thinking about what are students trying to achieve in their lives and, and how do we help them get there? And so uh, we take a th I take a theory in the book from uh, our research on innovation, which is called the jobs to be done theory around what really motivates people. And what the research suggests is that um, 
sort of this is from a famous marketing professor, Theodore Levitt uh, at Harvard years ago, who said, you know, people don't actually want to buy quarter inch drills. They just want the freaking hole, right? <laughs> they want the outcome. They don't care about your way of doing it per se. They 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 want to get, you know, they want to get to their end state, right? That's what's motivating them. But frankly, even this is a little incomplete because it ignores the context in which they want that outcome. And context is really important to understand meaning and what's valuable or not valuable to an individual or a community. And, you know, for example, in this particular case, you know, do you want the quarter inch hole so that you can hang some fancy piece of art in an art gallery? Well, a certain set of tools will be really good for that. But, you know, the blunt hammer, bang it through the wall, not going to do the job. But if you're hanging up something or putting wiring through in the back closet of your house where no one's ever going to look, maybe just that blunt force is going to be just fine. And so really helping understand the context is important. And the way I always like to think about this is, you know, what's better, steak or pizza? If you're lactose intolerant like me, maybe it's a fairly uh, obvious answer to this question. But for a lot of us, like we think, gosh, I don't know, I like them both. And it depends on the context, uh, though, you quickly realize that, like, for example, if you had a second grade soccer party, the last place you should bring them is to that high end steakhouse, right? It's a disaster waiting to happen that, you know, by the strip mall pizza shack, like that's the place for them. The flip side is you can imagine if you were in a business setting trying to imp impress like a client or something like that, the last place you'd want to bring them is that low end pizza shack that high-end steakhouse would be the, the the right choice in that context. And so context really gives meaning. And once you start to understand that motivation, then you can start to think through, okay, what do we, you know, what are the functional, social, emotional dimensions of what these individuals are trying to achieve to help them achieve them? What are the experiences we have to provide? And then like the the, the, the what stuff, like, what do we, you know, the curriculum, the 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 day to day experience? How do we snap all that stuff together to help them make progress uh, in their lives? The the way I like to think about this is the Simon Sinek uh, framing of the bottom layer is really the why. Why are they there? The experiences are the how, and then the what is that top layer. Um, and when you think about it from a student's perspective, what they're trying to achieve. Uh, in our research, what we've seen is that at a high level, every student is looking uh, to be successful and make progress in a meaningful way every single day. They don't want to feel like failures. They're looking for outlets in their lives where they can experience success. And the second one is they want to be in places where they can have fun with their friends. And the uh, reality is that schools seem like very social places where kids can experience these moments of success. But when you step back from it, you realize that while those experiences may exist for, say, let's just take the have fun with friends part of it, it may exist on the playground or in extracurricular activities, recess between periods in a high school or middle school. By and large, though, the actual academic experience itself is not a place where kids are supposed to have fun with their friends as, as it's constructed in traditional schools, right? Uh, people like me got in trouble when you <laughs> tried to have fun with their friends in, in middle school. Uh, it disrupts class. We have words for people who collaborate with their friends. It's called cheating often. Uh, and, and so we speak volumes about what we actually say kids are and are not allowed to do in these traditional classrooms. And it's not around having fun with friends. It's much more of an isolated, all eyes on me in the traditional experience, you know, quiet, don't have fun uh, uh, experience. And it speaks volumes that the places where they can have fun are frankly outside of the classroom. And it, you realize very quickly that from a student's perspective, in terms of where do they spend their time and where do they engage, school is one thing they can hire, if you will, to have fun with friends. But so too are those sports after school or music and arts or you know video games or, or all sorts of things that they can hire to have fun with friends. The same is true, frankly, for the experience success on a daily basis. 
you, you quickly realize that school is actually structured to make most students feel like failure or at least embed moments of failure in the design. So we have a, a system that's fixed time variable learning, right? We, we deliver content to students, we test and assess, and then students move on to the next unit, subject, body, material, whatever, and only get the results afterwards. And if they you know, only mastered 70% of the material, well, we've embedded failure of 30% and we give that a label. And we know that we create these gaps in student learning, what, what educators not so affectionately call the Swiss cheese effect uh, for, for kids. And, but the, the reality is that the system intentionally does that. It's not the fault of any educator, but this, this time-based factory model system embeds failure in its design. It embeds these Swiss cheese holes that develop in all kids' learning, frankly, uh, and they don't get to all experience success. Now, my big push is that can we then make, you know, look, learning loss was a useful framing to get resources, as we talked about, but as we shift to this opportunity and reinvention, let's shift to a framing of guaranteeing mastery for every single child so that we're embedding success in the design of school itself. And, you know, that would look like a, a learning fixed time variable system where we're still offering learning experiences to students. We're still testing and assessing because that's an important part of learning. But the purpose of that is to get real time or interactive feedback that informs what a child does next. And only at the end of that process do they actually progress to the next body of material once they can demonstrate mastery in a meaningful way of whatever they're working on. And they don't get to fully leave a concept until that point. The really cool thing about this from my perspective is it changes the world of assessments. They can be smaller, they can be more frequent, they don't have to take up a lot of time. And they're both for learning and they're of learning, right? They both inform what student does next, but they're also of learning because they tell us, has that child mastered this or not? Or maybe they're still working on this concept and that's okay as well, but it's a much more transparent picture. And it breaks this trade-off between summative versus formative versus interim assessments uh, that the field is a little obsessed with at the moment. Uh, interestingly enough, like Western Governors University, I don't know if you all have heard of it, but it's uh, it's an online university mastery or competency-based, serves 160,000 students enrolled roughly. Um, and they've done a masterful job of saying, yeah, like there's objective assessments where, you know, we can computer score these, there's a right or wrong answer. And then we have performance assessments. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump ahead. Performance assessments where, you know, students actually get to apply the learning in the context itself, right? Like, can they do the work where it matters? Um, in, in, you know, as a nurse or a teacher or whatever, or a real world project in the, in the example of K-12 learning, which I think is so powerful that they have both of these things. And you get to keep working at the performance until you truly demonstrate mastery. Um, and, and my sense also is that like doing this makes this part that we as educators care a lot about far more real for lack of a better phrase in the sense that like, I'll, I'll just take a, one of these, but, um, you know, we talk a lot about habits of success, growth mindset, grit, you know, working at something. But the reality is that educators can talk to their blue in the face about the importance of these sorts of things. But if at the end of the day, I take a test and I move on regardless of my effort to the next unit, then we systematically undermine this notion that grit and working hard at something or perseverance is important. Or, you know, the other way to think about it, like growth mindset, for example, uh, we talk a lot about, hey, you're not fixed in your abilities, you can work and learn and grow. But if at the end of the day, like in the time based system, I give you a grade and you have no ability to improve that grade, the system is sending an unambiguous signal that like, yeah, we may be talking about the importance of growth mindset, but the system doesn't really believe it. And we know that kids, you know, actions speak far louder than words. They're watching what we do, not what we say. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, the system undermines the very development of the things that we want to accomplish 
uh, as educators in many cases. Um, and, and I think it allows us to shift, frankly, uh, this mastery-based system to a, a self-directed learning cycle for kids where they actually start to set goals over time. They plan how they're going to go reach them. They do the learning. They show evidence of it. They reflect on the experience, and then they go set another goal. And it starts to embed these executive function skills, agency, and the things of that uh, nature, which are so powerful. Two other just uh, thoughts that that um, I'll breeze through a little bit faster, perhaps, uh, for time's sake, so we can have a little Q&A. But um, the second is around the 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 teacher experience. And, and my big push in the book is that I think we ought to be doing a heck of a lot more co-teaching or team teaching, where we're not making teachers be that island uh, to themselves, but but really allowing them to work with their fellow colleagues on a real-time daily basis with, with uh, students. So obviously the backdrop is very clear. There's a lot of unhappy teachers. Some are resigning, all sorts of debates over who's actually resigning or not. But we know that there's a shortage of substitutes. There's a declining teacher pipeline. But I'd argue like this picture wasn't all that bright before COVID as well for teachers because we've just been asking them to do so, so, so much from tutoring to mentoring to facilitating the learning experiences, cur curating content, designing learning experiences, evaluating student performance, counseling and being that you know social emotional uh, backstop for many uh, kids, delivering content, like on and on and on, all these things we've been asking teachers to do, which is effectively asking them to be superheroes. And while many teachers, and I'm sure many of you on, on this Zoom, ably step into it, it's just not a fair ask in, in, in my mind. Um, and I think it goes, uh, you know, there, there are better ways to do that, that if we can create larger groups of students with a few teachers that get to work off each other, or uh, Arizona State is uh, Teachers College is doing a lot of work right now with teacher uh, with districts around uh, creating these opportunities for teams of teachers and teachers to specialize in different areas and things of that nature. I, I think it's a really exciting set of experiences. Uh, in North Carolina, Public Impact works a lot with school districts around. Uh, multi-classroom leaders and things of that nature, right? To create very novel human capital experiences that frankly creates a bigger web of support around the teachers themselves, um, but also creates a, a, a better web of support um, for students themselves. Because if a teacher needs to be absent on a given day, then that's okay right? Because like there's two other teachers in the large learning environment, the continuity continues. There's no loss of learning or opportunity or connection for those students. And we've created a way more flexible teaching environment where like, it's okay if you have to take a day off because your kid's sick at home or you need to go attend to something for yourself. I, there's almost no profession that I can think of where we've attached the stakes we have to like that single teacher missing a given day and the impossibility of that burden uh, on, on individuals. Um, and it also ignores, I, I'm going to skip the theory of this for time's sake, but it ignores a lot of the research, frankly, around what motivates teachers, what motivates employees uh, and systematically undermines that in a lot of the ways in terms of the way we've designed um, the job. But I, I would also argue there's a bigger shift afoot here, which is that as we think about the theory of education reform over the last several decades, it's sort of like we've been on this giant rowboat with uh, 50 million students sitting on the, you know, on the rowboat and three some odd million teachers. And the theory of school reform has sort of been yelling at the teachers to just row harder, row faster. And the reality, I guess, is what if we like went to that self-directed learning cycle and gave every student an or themselves so that they could do some of the work and some of the rowing too. And I think we do that as we start to move to mastery-based learning or competency-based learning, where we start to give that self-directed learning cycle and students start to learn that, hey, we've got to pull our weight as well. We're all in this together. And it creates a much more positive sum uh, education system as opposed to this competitive cutthroat, I'm trying to win the game at your expense uh, sort of education system. Last 
couple thoughts. There's a lot of places we could go, but just as sort of wrapping up, the role of technology in all this is obviously a major question coming out of COVID, uh, the use of Zoom and other ed tech products and things of that nature. Um, and in my mind, I guess I just a push that you know there's no silver bullet or one size fits all technology answer for education. But the three tests that I would ask for teachers as you think about adopting it is one, does it save me time? And if no, it's not worth its salt. If it creates more work for you, you already have a lot of work. It's not that that tool is not the right fit. Second, it should extend the reach of teachers so that they can better understand their students, do more with their students, whatever it might be. And third, uh, does it deepen my understanding of my students? Can I better understand what they know, what they understand, what they need, what motivates them, whatever it might be? Can I more deeply have those more human one-on-one -on -one small group interactions as opposed to the one-to-many interactions so I can have a much deeper understanding of who my kids are? From a school's perspective, I think the three questions that systems, if you will, ought to be asking is one, does technology improve the feedback loops uh, between students and their learning for themselves, students and teachers and their learning, students to parents uh, and their learning, the learning to administrators, on and on. And the way I like to think about it is if a kid's shooting baskets, they get immediate feedback each time they they shoot, say a free throw, of did it go in or not? And then they can make adjustments, right? Based on it, they can change the angle of their wrist, they can change the angle of their elbow, how they release it, the flow of the shot and so forth. And their coaches, their peers, others around them can give them feedback as well because we're all getting instant feedback on like, how did what I just try? How did that work or not? And technology, I think ought to do the same thing. It shouldn't be this, this opaque box that cuts off information and just says, trust us, the technology knows what it's doing. It should be empowering educators and students uh, to take far more ownership uh, of their learning and understand what they need to try and, and the strategies that they're working on. The second thing is, I think technology is really good at offering experiences that we cannot offer uh, in the physical proximate environment in which a student is. So that might be a particular class that that child wants to learn or a particular subject area or connect with an expert in the professional world or, or a professor somewhere or whatever else it is to learn a particular thing. It might also be like virtual reality or simulation uh, for a field trip, say, that we can't get access to or a science lab. I want to do something that only MIT has the equipment for. I want to do it in my classroom. Virtual reality is a great way. Uh, to bring that experience in because we can't afford all that lab equipment. That's where I think technology can play a second really important role. And then the third thing, frankly, is like automating all those laborious manual tasks, if you will, the the the, the non-learning stuff, the 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 drudgery, if you will, to free up teachers to do what teachers do uniquely well, which is connect with students at a human level that a machine will never be able to do. And I think anything that frees up time from the administrative tasks that are more rules-based perhaps uh, is an incredibly important uh, role uh, for, for, for technology that it, that it can play uh, as well. And so I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, hopefully that's a helpful framing uh, with some juicy thoughts to get us going. It's a little longer than I meant to go. I apologize, um, but uh, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Michael. That was a, a, a great introduction to some of your thoughts surrounding the, the future of K-12 education. I know at least one of our attendees here today said she listened to your book on audio tape and she thought she absolutely had to have the hardcover because you referenced so many fabulous materials within it. So just as a little feedback there. Well, um, my under and my understanding briefly is that the audio version sort of uh, the technical word is sucks because I think they like read like www.youtube.com. Oh, no. I've heard it's a little brutal to listen oh. to those links. So I don't know which of you uh, has heard it, but that's what I've, the, the feedback I've gotten and I, I gave it to the publisher too. And I said, I really wanted to read it myself for this reason. But anyway. <laughs> Kudos to Lee for, for listening to it. Yeah, getting through that, seriously.
Well, listen, um, would anyone like to unmute themselves and, and have any questions or response to, to Michael? I'd love to know, um, he spoke a lot about mastery. If any of you guys are already implementing mastery, it'd be great to know maybe if, like Michael suggested, you use this reopening stage to further along this idea of bringing mastery techniques into the classroom. Kelly, would you like to go ahead? Yes, I'm really excited to um, read the book uh, to give some ideas to CMS as we are kind of reimagining things. So this conversation came up because the board changed our policy to only four perform tasks and they um, we have not gone to a standards grading. Um, and so we kind of like those of us that do mastery learning, we're still trying to fit it into the grades of before's box um, where the students would like, you know, in your book, I'm wondering like how you um, address standards and with the time, because we have to go by quarters. So would you do the standards by the whole class or would you do the quarters like we do now or we evaluate halfway through and then would their child's grade be based on the mastery? Just kind of how it fits into the performance test and how we can reimagine it. And Yeah, I love the question. Um, and if I don't fully answer it, then come back on and 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 uh, and, and amplify what I don't. But um, what I'll say at a macro level, the book takes the standpoint that like starting with the grading is the wrong place to start. Like we want to start with the mastery of the learning, and then we can call it whatever we want on the on on the back end, right? Um, but uh, I, you know, I see a lot of school districts changing the grading as opposed to actually moving to mastery learning and insisting on the mastery, right, for each individual. And that to me is like the paramount first step. And then the grading, I think, falls after that, right? Which is to say, at any given point in time, in effect, a student has a grade, if you will, quote unquote, which is really information on how they're doing. And, and the way I conceptualize it in the book, and uh, there are other ways to think about it, but the way I conceptualize it is for any given standard, you have a you have a grade of like not yet started, right? Or I have a grade of, gee, just beginning, a grade of almost mastered, and then a grade of mastery. Um, and the, the other push I, I make in the book is um, a lot of standards-based grading has this sense of like proficiency or mastery is a three, and then like exceeding is a four. And I'm like, if you're exceeding, you're working on a new standard. <laughs> um, like, I think that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, it, that's like a relic in my mind of our extra credit, like, you know, uh, for like being, a, you know, helping helping the teacher clean up the lab or something. Yeah, that's so, like so true because in Mastery Connect, which our district switch into, you say like four out of five is good. But for me, like once they hit 80%, 90, then we are going into the next level. And so I'm like, uh, you know, how are we using this data? And we have other technologies, like I'm not sure if you're familiar with CK12, but it's yeah. got a dial on like how much they've mastered it. The kids get really into that. Um, I, the kids love I'm, it. Right? Yeah, I'm obsessed with gamification and standards. That's a whole new area I haven't discovered, but I'm really interested in read your book. No, but I'm totally with you on this part. Like the kids love it because it makes the rules of the game far more transparent to them. And, and kids love that when like, not only do I know the syllabus for like the next quarter or the next semester or the next year, but like, I actually know what I need to master to graduate high school. Like all of it is there. And I can realize, am I on track? Am I off track? Am I ahead right in any given thing? And like the marker, I think more becomes like that, right? Like it's me against a standard as opposed to me against my peers. And I also get choices. Like, do I want to go deeper in this area? Maybe on some standards that aren't required, but like, I'm really excited about this. I'm building passion. Awesome. I'm going to go deeper or maybe like, Hey, that was enough. I'm glad I mastered it. I want to go faster. And like, that's a choice that we get to give the students is, is part of the argument. Um, and, you know, and then that still allows us to, you know, compare a kid, I guess. I, to me, that's not really the point the more important thing is that the kid can represent who they are and find colleges that, and, and career pathways and so forth that are good matches for like the things that they're excited about and passionate about and demonstrated interest in and mastery of and so forth. And so um, that that's how I think about it is like, you know, if, 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 and so by the way, the other piece of this is there are certain standards like, math is one of those cumulative things, right? Where we probably say like, you really do need to master this before you move on 
and and hit algebra, for example, or something like that. Because if you if you're struggling with double digit multiplication, like this is going to be brutal, right? There's certain standards in other subject areas where like maybe it's not a, a power standard or a core standard. We don't say you've mastered it. We don't say you've moved on from it. We say you haven't finished it yet. And that's, you know, maybe that's always the representation. Um, but it's also an indication of that. It, it's a very clear indication of like, hey, if this is important to me, then I got to work at it and master it. Otherwise, like it's not, you know, there's not that mastery. And I think the cool thing for the school then is to think through, okay, what are the things that are really important that every child masters for graduation? And what are the things that we're a little bit more okay with if the kid says like, that's just not me. I've worked at it. I've shown you I've worked at it, but like, I really want to go deep on this instead. I think some of that flexibility, particularly as kids get older, it's kind of cool because it, it, it gives them more choice over time. In, um, in your book, does it have suggested maybe routes for a math teacher? We don't have textbooks or like we're doing a lot of research on our own. Um, so where we can get the project based learning with the power, you know, I just wondered if you had resources in there. Yeah. Um, so this, the, the book has a bunch of videos, which I think was what Barbara was referencing of schools that have made these jumps or different methodologies and things like that. So you can certainly check those out. Um, I try to not recommend like products or things like that in the actual book itself. I'm, I'm, I, I know a few crept in cause like I was just, the story was unavoidable without it. Um, but you know, frankly, Barbara has my email. Like I'm happy if you want to just ask like, Hey, have you seen something really cool that works here or someone that would know happy to trade ideas and that stuff over email. Cause it's, it's fun to geek out on like uh, where, where, where we get these ideas. Cause I do think the real beauty is like, and, and um, I just finished the book grasp by Sanjay Sarma, which I highly recommend. Um, but I think it does the best job of like debunking the fight between the constructivist versus the behaviorist camp and learning and being like, this is the biggest false dichotomy in the world. Like, of course, the plot and like having a purpose and projects are important and scaffolding the learning and making sure they learn the knowledge is important so they can do meaningful projects like both are important, right? Uh, you never throw the kid into the deep end and without knowing something about swimming. Um, but you're also not like learning the stroke for its own sake. You're doing it so you can do something in the water. Um, and so I think it does a really good job of thinking about that. And, and to me, that's the really exciting part of this is weaving these big questions or projects or problems or whatever it is with the knowledge and skills so that it motivates learners to say like, I want to go figure that out because that's something meaningful. I have a question about um, the, the information you shared about like the disaggregated instructional model. Um, yeah. That is really compelling to me as I think about like wanting to leverage more interdisciplinary learning in our school, but also about how lean our staff is. And so I'm just wondering what advice or suggestions you'd have around um, reframing and uh, staffing models in places where like it's, we're really lean in terms of personnel, but also really lean where we're in terms of like finances and how can we really sort of like leverage that model in a way that pushes toward um, the disaggregation and differentiation that you're that you're speaking of because I feel like that would be a game changer. Yeah, I love the question. Um, my sense is, frankly, you build like you have bigger learning environments with more kids so that you can you know, it might be three teachers with 90 kids or something like that, or four teachers with a hundred kids, right. Or something like that. Um, and maybe three of the teachers are fully certified and one's a para pro, right. Or something like you, you can, and you can start to do things, uh, imagine things differently there. Um, the way ASU does it when they work the, the, the Mary Lou Fulton teachers college, when they work with school districts, they say like, we know each kid is bringing a certain amount of funding to your district. So let's look at the learning environment. If that's, again, I'm going to make it up. Like if that's $300,000, yes, we know some of it goes to the district and the administration, but like you're, you have this amount of money, how do you want to spend it to staff it basically? Right. And maybe you decide like, actually we want to have a, 
a counselor in, you know, in every single learning environment among those three or four adults, right? Like we want to change who we're hiring and, and, and the expertise that they bring in. And the other couple will be the subject matter expertise or, you know, the actually again in grasp, like does a great job of saying like, well, if we reimagine courses instead of like around like learning, ob, you know, objectives, like, well, of course you're going to want to have like, you know, you're thinking in his examples, like artificial intelligence, of course, you're going to want to have the computer science person alongside the math person, but you're also going to want to have the ethicist, right? And, and the philosophy person like there to like, think about the dimensions of this question. And like, I think you can start to get there with the high school um, as well. Once you realize like, wow, if we get to restructure human capital, that gives us license to do like a whole bunch of things very differently, right? Um, Public Impact in North Carolina, the nonprofit consultancy, um, I, I, they do a lot of work also with schools, helping them uh, figure out these restructuring on, on the human capital side. And it and they actually find often that it saves money in some in some ways. Um, I don't fully, you know, know how that ripples through, but but that's what they found in their in in their findings as they create these bigger webs of support. So so I all to say, like, I think the challenge of the budgetary situation, which maybe it's less of a challenge at the moment, but it's going to be a challenge certainly when the ESSER dollars runs out, right? Um, uh, it, it, maybe it's actually an opportunity to actually force some of this reinvention and create a better profession for teachers because y'all deserve it. Yeah, I feel like that was the other really resonant point is just like, we are asking so much all the time of our teachers and, and how can we, we have to start thinking creatively about mitigating that for them in order yeah. to increase their capacity and efficacy. Yeah, I mean, and we just would never do this. And like, I, I'm sure there are other professions where we do this, and I don't know of them. But we most professions have evolved away from like asking the one superhero to do every single task. Um, and have created these divisions of labor or ways to ping pong. And it doesn't even have to be formal, frankly, like I obviously the slide I showed was a very specific way that we divided up the you know, those roles. But it can be also much more informal. Like you go into a Montessori classroom, for example, and they're just bouncing off each other so that they can be working in small groups, right? And, and getting to know those kids and assess them better. But my observation, frankly, is like, I know as a teacher, like the data is just not my thing. <laughs> like I love to have someone alongside me and they're charting, you know, I do a case study classroom um, at the class that I teach. Um, I have someone alongside me who's charting, you know, who's saying what, how many times, like participation, right? Like all that stuff. And they can help me think through afterwards, where are my blind spots? It's just not my strength. <laughs> and so I don't specialize there. I mitigate it, right? And I get to, but I get to double down on my strength, which is I love sparking conversation and the questions uh, of the students and pushing them to think and answer it themselves, right? Like, I love that part of it um, and unpacking these concepts. So I, I lean in on, on that piece. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say, I love the book. Um, I was like really excited to, you know, that gives you real practical ways to kind of reach this new idea of flexibility in school. And my question is, how do you go about, you know, taking that energy and wanting to change, but then getting a pushback from so many people that are involved in the school system? Oh, it's such a good question. Um, you know, I'll be super honest and transparent. Like there's days, right, where it's super depressing, right? And you're just down on it because everyone is, yeah, but, yeah, but, or, you know, outright punching you down, right? Um, I, I honestly, what I take from it is like, try to understand their perspective, number one, and then not force them to make the change. And that's honestly where I get to those small group of educators that have the license to do it. And, and so, and, and, and honestly, giving the parents and students the license to opt in, um, I think is really important. So we're not forcing the change, but then we build success, right? And 
you know, just like they say, success is the best deodorant in sports for uh, for a bad team culture in, 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 in a sports team. I think success is like the best thing that attracts families and parents and educators to say, oh, I want to be part of that. You know, there's a school in Los Altos where they moved to a blended learning model for the fifth grade classrooms. And um, what they, you know, they started like seeing the students just soar and like the kids who weren't quote unquote math kids, like all of a sudden we're working above grade level and all this stuff. And then like word got around and the parents of fourth graders midway through the year, like went in and were like, why aren't you doing that for us? <laughs> and the teachers were like, yeah, good question. Cause we want to be part of it too. Like our colleagues over there are having all the fun and we're doing it the old way. Right. And um, so, so part of the lesson I take from that is like, don't force it on people. Start with a coalition of the willing that's excited to do it. So you're not pushing everyone to make the change because um, it's hard to push a rope, right? It's e much easier to create that pull and that magnetism that then they want to join. And by the way, maybe it's okay. Like not everyone wants to join the new way of doing things. Maybe a different group of educators comes up with like a second way, right? And, and, and parents join that and like, that's okay. Um, one of the interesting things, because we're recording it, I'll leave the name off, but, um, one of the case studies in the book of like doing this masterfully, I think they created a lot of schools within schools, micro schools, allowed parents and students to opt into these different communities within the schools. Um, they've had a lot of retrenchment as I understand it over the last year, frankly. And so it was a little depressing. Like I was like, oh, they're like a big case study in my book. This, this stinks. But as I looked into it, I actually think they prove the bigger point of the book because my understanding is where it started to go south is that the superintendent implemented a technology across all of the schools within schools that they had created. And a bunch of parents and educators were like, whoa, and got pretty upset about it for a variety of different reasons. And that started creating wheels in motion that started unraveling a lot of what they had accomplished. Um, and then there was a wave school board election and got super political and like undid a lot of the things. Um, but I think it's because like they started making it one size fits all and forcing people in. And I, I guess my big takeaway from COVID is we already knew that there was no one size fits all way to educate a kid. But I think these parent and educator communities, there's no one size fits all way to do school either for them. And so we have to be respectful uh, and create these these areas um, uh, uh, for them as well. That that was sort of my humble pie, but also affirmative takeaway is like, let's try to avoid the food fights and get people to join us because they see the success for their kids and they're really excited as opposed to say like, have your medicine, it'll be good for you, trust us. It's a great question though, because gosh, it's not easy some of these days. And Andrea, this may have happened before you joined the Teaching Fellows Institute, but we had a session uh, with, with uh, Linda, her last name is escaping me, of Resilience Alliance, and it was on successful change. And I've put our YouTube video of that workshop uh, on there just because that could have some tips for you about how to get people on side in those sorts of situations. Yeah, I participated, yep. I oh, participated. Good, 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 okay, great. Yeah. Can't remember who was there or who wasn't, but for anyone else on the call. So, um, and that can help in that. I think we might have time for one more question, one more quick question. I don't wanna pull Michael much over an hour. I know he's probably gotta get up and teach in the morning. So um, is there anyone else who might wanna mention something? And then I put all the links that I um, have found of Michael's really valuable stuff of more long form. Obviously there's social, I didn't put any social media on but more of his long form stuff, his YouTube channel, podcast and website. And you can sign up for the, all those things on there, which can give you, you can look past and search on their search functions in there to find any information that might pop into your mind tomorrow after we meet. Well, um, with that, and as we're approaching nine o'clock, I think what we'll do is thank Michael so very much for being with us. And um, mm -hmm. as always, guys, you know what? I, I just ask that what you do is you share what you've learned here with TFI, um, share the book you've received from us with a colleague, or maybe even your principal, if, if you think that's appropriate, and um, and spread the good word about what Michael is doing and and some and how he's thinking about education 
for the future. So with well, that, let me just, back. yeah. And let me just thank you all, frankly, from the bottom of my heart. Cause like, there isn't anything more noble than what y'all are doing. So I just, I, you know, I, I got two little ones who are hopefully asleep. We'll find out. Uh, but they're, uh, but, um, but you know, on it, it's incredibly important and it's incredibly hard work and I'm incredibly appreciative of what y'all do. So thank you.